In January, I received the invitation to attend my 10-year high school reunion, and I was shocked. High school did not feel like it was 10 years ago. So to be invited to something that was a celebration of 10 years when it only felt like a couple months, maybe a year or two, really threw me for a loop. I began thinking of what reunions meant to me and ideas of TV shows and movies where they depict cheerleaders marrying deadbeat guys and jocks getting fat and bald were the only images that I had and they were very critical and condescending and they weren't very inviting or warm. I began going through all my accomplishments over the last 10 years, thinking about what I've done and what I would tell my classmates. The places I went to school, the degrees I've collected, the places that I've traveled to, where I've lived, my job. But something about that felt really hollow, like that was not possibly all I've done over the last 10 years. So I kept mulling this over in my mind, what I've accomplished, reunions, and something became clear to me while I was doing that. And that was that the last 10 years of my life, my biggest accomplishment wasn't that I've gotten degrees and I've started a great job and I live in a fancy condo. It was that I've grown from the person that I was in high school into a confident, self-sufficient adult. The 10 years after high school are really hard there are a lot of young people in the room today, and this talk is catered to you, the people who are in the process of this 10-year journey. You're going to learn a lot of hard lessons about heartbreak and failure and picking yourself up when, you're, when you've fallen down. But when you get through that and look back, you're going to have such a sense of fulfillment and relief and joy and celebration to the person that you become as you journey through all those really hard lessons. You have to find your path during this time period, and that's really scary. But you also have to find out who you are as a person. And the lessons that I want to share with you today, there are five, are some of the things that I've really learned over the last couple of years that I hope help you all on your journey as you make your way through this time period as well. So the first lesson that I have is to do what's right for you. And that sounds really simple. You're doing you every day, you wake up, you brush your teeth, you go to work or school or or whatever it is that you spill your day doing. But as you get older, the voices around you become quieter. Your teachers start giving you less instruction. Your parents take a step back and say, no, you have to figure this out. And bosses give you even less feedback than both of them. So how do you learn to manage that and navigate that? For me, this was a lesson that I learned in a very impactful moment. It was a night and day difference. A switch went off in my mind. In high school, I spent a lot of time doing performance arts. I act and I sang and I danced and I was involved in every single community theater production that I could possibly get my hands into. The photo is actually of me dancing, uh, taken by Paul Aiken. So when it came time to go off to higher education, it was natural, it wasn't really a question. I was gonna go and pursue performance arts. I was gonna act and sing and dance all day long, you know, maybe teach, maybe if I was really lucky, become a performer and get paid to do this. So I auditioned and I got into a school and I started. But something wasn't quite right. I wasn't as happy as I, I should have been. And the little things would really set me off and give me a really bad day. I finished the first semester, went home for Christmas break, reconnected with my family, my friends, and my home. And when I went back to school for that second semester, I realized that something was really wrong. It wasn't just kind of off, it was wrong. I called my mom in tears. It's like, I don't understand. I should be so happy right now. This is my dream come true, but the subway's late and I want to cry. Or my classmate says something, something to me and I'm a mess for the rest of the day. This isn't normal and it's not healthy. What's wrong with me? And my mom said, well, is this right for you? And the answer was no. We have to find a way to listen to that tiny voice inside of us. Now, while you're young, before you have kids and a mortgage, or you're 30 years into a very established career and you, the idea of starting over again is terrifying, taking the time to develop that voice, that gut feeling, whatever it is for you to navigate major decisions, is critical. And as you do that and gain confidence in that voice and in that decision-making process, 
You're going to build a life based on decisions that you are so happy with. And you're going to create a life that's so content and amazing and fulfilling that you couldn't imagine it any other way. The second lesson that I have for you is to accept yourself for who you are. Every single person on the planet has something about themselves that they don't like. Some people are better at hiding it than others. That's something that I've learned with my, over this last 10 years, but everyone has that thing. It could be physical, it could be mental, it could be completely made up. For me, it was my height. I had my growth spurt when I was quite young. I was probably 12, 13 when I grew. I'm 5'9". So that meant I was about a foot taller than all the boys in my class until college when they started to grow at ages 17, 18, 19. So I would slouch in photos, I'd wear flat shoes, I would do everything I could to create the illusion on social media that I wasn't as tall. But then I would look at those photos and I wouldn't feel any satisfaction because I looked unattractive because I was slouching or standing kind of crooked to try and make myself the same height as my peers. Learning to accept myself for who I was wasn't an overnight snap of the fingers moment. It was a full 10 year process. And some days I wake up and I'm looking at my closet and it's like, do I want to be six foot tall and wear the heels or do I want to kind of blend in more and wear the flats? But the point is, it's a decision. You have to decide to accept yourself. Find one little thing to like about that thing that you don't like. Then build on it. Slowly create a foundation, a baseline, where you can be find a sense of acceptance for yourself. Now it could be a mental thing, it could be maybe the way you answer questions or the way thoughts bounce around in your head, or it could be the way you laugh. Maybe it's an ethnicity issue or a heritage issue where you've got multiracial parents. Everyone has something that they're self-conscious about. So find a way to start the acceptance process and work through it because it'll take you places that you never thought you could imagine. Now the third lesson is hopefully going to lighten things up a bit because those are two kind of heavy, thought-provoking ideas, and that was to find your sense of humor. Life is going to throw at you bad days, and you think it's bad, and it's 12 o'clock, and you're like, oh God, how could it get any worse? And then you know what? It, it does. We've all had those days where we're late, we spill coffee all over ourselves. we've got a big meeting with the boss, we come in here astray for if you're a girl, maybe stain or unshaven if you're a guy. It happens. Now the question is, how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to criticize yourself for the rest of the day and hold your head down and, and struggle through? Or are you going to find a way to laugh it off and move forward and be your own cheerleader? Growing up, I grew up in a house with three dogs, and I took the stance, you know, being dramatic and having teenage angst, that I didn't like dogs. No logical reason at all, just the fact that I wanted probably to annoy my parents and not liking the dogs did that. So I would make a huge stink about it, complaining about the hair and the barking and wouldn't help out with them at all. But when I moved away to school, something happened that I never expected. I missed them. I missed the dogs. And I couldn't tell my parents because of all the fuss that I had spent making over the last 10 years if I told them, that would open the door to teasing that I did not want to experience. But missing them didn't go away and hiding from the fact that I liked dogs wasn't helpful either because I was in the process of adopting my own little cutie. So one day I told them, hey guys, I really actually like dogs, surprise, and <laughs> accepted the teasing and it still happens to this day. They still tease me about it, but the fact is I can laugh it off. You have to find a way to roll it off your shoulder and praise yourself be your own cheerleader, because the world's doing enough criticizing for you already. You don't need to be adding to that list. The fourth lesson that I have is to take a leap of faith. We're all going to be given opportunities. They might look a little different than we expect. When I was applying to graduate schools, a professor told me, you have to pick a school based off of the professors and the research outputs of that university. Don't pick it off of the name of the school, the location. You really want to pick it based on the maximum outcome of education that you can get. So taking this information to heart, I began my search, researching different schools. Being from the Caribbean, my scope was pointed at the equator, and maybe Australia for her surfer dudes, but I had no intention of actually going there. 
And I wasn't finding what I was looking for. The professors weren't quite researching the exact area I wanted to be in. The research outputs weren't quite as interdisciplinary as I had hoped. So I kept looking, and I kept looking, and I still wasn't finding it. So one day, in, in a very frustrated mental state, I just began to slam in keywords into Google, angry typing, you know, take out the aggression on your keyboard. And I put in words like marine, and management, and interdisciplinary, and law and policy, and coastal management. And out popped this program, first hit, that seemed almost too good to be true. It was doing the exact sort of research I was looking for, with professors that were, with the experience just that I was looking for, with alumni and jobs that I would dream of having. The kicker was, it was in Nova Scotia, Canada. Not near the equator at all. A very hard place to get to from the Caribbean. So I had to make the choice. Do I take this opportunity, or do I let it pass me by? I had the financial resources to go. I got accepted into the program, and it was exactly what I was looking for. Well, I made the decision to go, and it was fantastic. It opened door after door after door. Research projects led to jobs, which led to the job I have today, which I love. So opportunities are going to be presented to you but they may not look what, how you're expecting. The timing might be off, the location might be off, or the person may be off. But if there is no real reason not to do it, there is no block to your safety, perhaps your finances, then take it. Have confidence in your ability that you can master this step. Because one of two things can happen. You're either gonna hate it, and okay, that sounds scary at first, you hate something. But think about it. You hate something, you've just learned about a whole new thing about yourself you probably didn't know before, which can help shape you making better decisions in the future. Or you like it, maybe even love it, and that opens door after door of opportunity and before you know you've built a life that you are so fulfilled with and so proud of to call your own. So take it, take that leap of faith. The final lesson that I have for you is a combination of all the other lessons. When you start to do what's right for you, you start to hone in on that inner voice that you have in driving your decisions based on what the best thing for you is. And you start to accept yourself for who you are and stop trying to be anybody else. And you find your sense of humor and become a cheerleader as opposed to a critic. And you start embracing the silly things you do. And then you start to have confidence in your ability and you take advantage of those opportunities, those leaps of faith something starts to happen, and you start to like yourself. And that's something we as a society don't talk about very often, is this idea of liking yourself, and developing that like into love. And I'm not talking about in a cocky way. We've all seen those people in rooms with their chests up, and, and you think, oh God, who do they think that they are for you know, standing and having that aura about them? I'm talking about liking yourself in a very humble and grounded way, where you're so at peace with the person that you are and the decisions that you've made and the life that you've created around you that you want other people to experience that. You want to help others. When you love yourself, all the relationships around you start to change. You start to build stronger relationships with your family, with your friends, intimate relationships with lovers. It really starts to change how you interact with the world and how the world interacts with you. And it's something that I wish everyone can experience. So wrapping up the talk and the idea of these five lessons, I wouldn't have got to where I am today without an incredible support network. My family talked to me. They told me stories. When I had locked my keys out of my apartment and called them in tears because the super was on vacation and I didn't know what to do, I had no way of getting in there, they consoled me and they told me stories that they had that were equivalent. Or when I had that big meeting and the coffee cup went right down the front of my shirt and of course I was wearing a light color so the, everyone in the conference room could see it, call it, called them and my dad told me a story of when he did something very similar. We have to communicate with each other and talk more because you never know the impact of what something that you think is insignificant can have on someone else. So my challenge to everybody in this room today is one of two things and it will depend entirely on your age. For those of you who are out of this 10-year period, I want you to share your stories. Try and take an opportunity when a young person comes to you 
and say what's happened to you, what was equivalent. Help them not feel alone and like the world's going to end. Help them know that other people have been through this and that they will survive. And young people in the room, I want you to listen. I didn't. I fought this battle uphill the entire way there until literally my only option was to try listening because all my other arguments and reason not to had failed. So listen to the stories in your life because there might be a nugget of information in there that helps you see something in a different way. It might help you find some way to accept the thing about yourself that you don't like. This 10-year process is not easy. It's really hard and you're faced with real challenges that you've never seen before. Financial issues, maybe family issues, maybe, maybe getting married or having children. But as you look back, it can be so fulfilling and rewarding if you find ways to really love yourself. So good luck to all you guys on the next 10 years of your life. My reunion is in two weeks, so I look forward to seeing how that goes. Thank you.